chapter number 18. 1 Samuel chapter number 18 this morning. 1 Samuel chapter number 18. And when you've found it this morning, stand for the reading of God's Word today. As we are talking about the irresistible church, consenting... Uh, continuing to speak and to talk to the Lord about the irresistible church, a church <coughs> that heaven is attracted to. Amen. First Samuel chapter number 18, stand with me for the word of God today as we read, talking about the irresistible church, a church that heaven is attracted to. This is the fifth uh, in an eight-part series as we're preaching on the irresistible church. How many of you want to be a church that heaven gets involved in? Amen. How many of you want to be a church where Jesus shows up every time we have church? Amen. I want to be a part of that church. It's the longing and the desire of your pastor's heart that we be a church that's not irresistible to the world, but that we be a church that's irresistible to heaven. Most churches are spending more time marketing for members than they are posturing for the presence of God. And I don't want us to ever get to the place, church family, where we spend all of our money and our time and our effort, Brother Sammy, marketing for members when we should be posturing and getting ourselves ready for the presence of God. What's the difference, Pastor? Here's the difference. If the presence of God shows up, you don't have to worry about marketing for members. Amen? Because God will come. Hallelujah. And when He comes, people come. Amen. And God does a miraculous thing in our eyes. Let's read today 1 Samuel chapter 18 beginning with verse number 1. Verse number 1. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him even as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more into his father's house. And Jonathan and David made a covenant together because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of his robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle this morning. Bow your heads with me today as we preach upon the irresistible church, a church that heaven is attracted to. And we preach from this thought this morning. It promotes healthy relationships it promotes healthy relationships let's pray together father we come to you today father lord with the benefit and the opportunity lord and the special advantage and the opportunity today to receive from the word of god this morning and father as we come to you in this service today lord we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of god and we ask you lord to lift us up today i ask you lord to lift up this congregation and to lift up this group of people father to hear and to obey your word today father i pray to today for a special anointing Father on the preaching of God's word today I pray you'll move me out of the way I pray that the Lord Jesus will step forward in this moment Lord and that Father you will break me break open this vessel Father tear the seal off of the vessel of my heart and pour out from the seal of the vessel of my heart Father everything that thus saith the Lord would say unto this people this morning and then God I pray that as we are receiving the word today that men and women Father will be moved of the Holy Spirit Lord as they hear the word today and they will be changed and never be the same again and I thank you and give you the praise and all God's children said amen and amen and amen you can be seated in the house of the Lord today we're so delighted to have all of you here thank you for being here this morning 1 Samuel chapter 18 verse number 1 says these words and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David and Jonathan loved Loved him as his own soul. Let me ask you in this place this morning a question. Do you have anyone in your life, a friend, a loved one, neighbor, someone that's really close to you that you would say, Pastor, that person knows everything about me? Come on, lift your hand this morning. Pastor, that person knows everything about me. They are, they are my friend. They are my helper. They're a strength to me. They're an encourager to me. They help me. Husbands, that was a great time for you to lift your hand and look at your wife this morning, okay? It's all right. I'll ask you again. How many of you would say, Pastor, I know someone that knows everything about me? Amen. There you go, husbands. You did better. Praise the Lord. And so it means that Jonathan's soul was knit to David's soul. It didn't mean that they didn't have a thing 
going on with one another. But what it meant was is that those two guys knew everything about each other. That they understood one another. That they fellowshiped together. And they loved being together because they were people of like precious faith. They understood one another. They understood each other's hearts. They understood each other's emotions. Well, church family, do you know this morning that you and I not only should have a tight-knit relationship with Jesus, but we need a tight-knit relationship with others. We need a tight-knit relationship with others. Why? Because you cannot survive by yourself. You cannot survive by yourself. There are a lot of people that are in the body of Christ that have become professional survivalists. They, they're professional survivalists in the body of Christ. What are professional survivalists in the body of Christ? They have Christian television. They have their Bible, they have their tapes, their CDs, their radio. They have all of the Christian survival kit that they need in order to be a Christian survivalist. And they set at home. Some people are doing that this morning. Sitting at home, watching Charles Stanley, watching John Hagee, watching all the wonderful survival kits that are provided to the body of Christ to, in order to keep your spirit and your soul alive as long as you stay in your hermetic state as a hermit living in your house as a little Christian waiting for Jesus Christ to come back someday and blow the doors off of your house and suck you up into the sky. And so we have Christian hermits, church family, Christian survivalists that are waiting, sitting in front of the television, holding on to their Bible, making sure that they're in line with everything John Hagee says and everything all the prophets says and everything all of the different people say. And then they flip over to the Word of Faith because they still want to get blessed even before Jesus comes. So they watch Creflo Dollar and they watch Joyce Meyer and they watch Kenneth Hagin and they watch all of these different things so that they can get their faith built up to believe for a lot of things and then they flip back over in the middle of the road and they watch a good Baptist preacher called Charles Stanley and they sit there and they survive and they just sit in their house and hermit themselves waiting for the return of Christ. Church family, God never meant for you to be a Christian survivalist. He never meant for you to be a Christian hermit just hiding in your house waiting for the return of the Lord. No, 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 no. God meant for you, amen, to be a hero. God meant for you to be a conqueror. He meant for you to be an overcomer. But in order to do that, you've got to get around people. Amen. <laughs> you've got to get around people. And you have to have that healthy relationship and that promotion of a healthy relationship. So this fifth trait of what we're talking about as an irresistible church is an irresistible church promotes healthy relationships in the church. Can I tell you, we're not the church if we're not together. We're not the church if we're not together. Well, pastor, we're in church this morning. That doesn't necessarily mean we are the church. It doesn't necessarily mean we are the church this morning just because we gathered here today. Just because we gathered here in His name and we worshiped here together today and we gave in the offering today and we participated in the worship service today or we sat in a pew and warmed a pew and we participated in the preaching of God's Word today. We don't become the church until we lose our agenda for ourselves and we promote and love our neighbor above ourselves. That's when we become the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the Bible says says that you are members in particular and you are the body of Christ. Look at your uh, look at your neighbor this morning and say you're a part of my body. You're a part of my body. <laughs> you are. You're a part of my body. We are not the church unless we are the body of Christ. And that means we have to have a relationship with one another. We have to have a closeness with one another. We have to have a genuineness with one another. It builds healthy relationships. Jonathan's soul was knit with the soul of David. You see, church family, relationships are built on love. They're built on love. What is love? Love is the intentional exploration and discovery of another person's life. That's what love is. Love is the intentional exploration and discovery of another person's life. If you look at someone and you say the words, I love you, what you are saying is you're saying, I am intent on exploring and understanding all there is about you. That's what the word love means. When you say the words I love you, it means I have the intention to explore you, to understand you, to cope with you, to be a part of your life, to discover everything there is about you. It's the assessment of the interests and the desires and the needs of that person. It's the concerted effort to respond to that ass assessment in ways that the other person will clearly recognize. You know, our church has core values as a church. We have fundamental beliefs as a church. We practice 16 
fundamental truths of a full gospel church. We also practice the four pillars of our faith. Those four pillars are Jesus is pillars. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the healer. Jesus is uh, the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. And Jesus is the soon coming King. We practice these pillars. And then we have as a church a model for ministry. We say within our model of ministry that we are committed, we are commissioned, and we are compassionate. And we use those words constantly in our bulletins. We use them in our letterhead. We use them in all of our information that we provide out on our lobby table. Within that information, there are eight core values that we have as a church. The number one core value that we have as a church, the first and very most foremost priority core value that we have as a church is we believe as a church, as Victory Family Worship Center, that we should be a tight-knit church family. We believe that. Why? Because we need to know how to build and lift up one another. How to be there for one another because we don't know who in this body came in this room hurting this morning. We don't know who came in this room this morning dealing with stress. Who came in this room dealing with anxiety. Who came in this room this morning dealing with depression. And it's our job as the church of Jesus Christ and as Victory Family Worship Center to love and to care for those who are hurting this morning and to build them up and edify them in their most holy faith. Can you say praise the Lord? That is the job of our church. That is the core values of our church. You say, well, pastor, why are you talking about core values? Don't you understand that when you talk about church growth and talk about the future, you should talk about vision? Let me tell you something. Every good, godly man of God has plenty of vision. They have plenty of vision. What they don't have is a group of people that will support and work within the confines of that vision to make it happen. That's what they don't have. Why do they not have it? Don't they understand if you get a vision from God that everyone's supposed to come on board and follow? Here's what I found out, Brother Sammy, is that people don't follow vision, but people rally around values. They rally around values and out of your values comes your vision. And there are so many great men of God that have great visions of God and want to accomplish great things but they can't accomplish those things because they can't get a group of people to come into agreement with one another. How can two walk together except they be agreed? And if we don't have agreement on something, we can't ever accomplish a common vision. Now let me just throw some vision out here for you this morning so that you can agree with it within the basis of our values today. How many of you would join in the vision with me and say, Pastor, we want to see our church filled to capacity full of people. Amen. Praising and worshiping God. Then what does it take? It's going to take you and I becoming a tight-knit church family. It's going to take us having some candid communication. It's going to take us being faithful and loyal to one another. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's going to take some common values that we have. And one of those common values is that we become a tight-knit church family. So what does that mean, Pastor, a tight-knit church family? That means when you hear of somebody in the family that's hurting, you don't go and spread the gossip and tell everybody so-and-so's hurting. No, what you do is you call them up and you send them a card and a letter and you lift them up and build them up in their most holy faith and you undergird them and you love them and you say, hey, I'm here to listen about whatever you're going through. I'm here to help you and I'm here to carry you along until God heals you and restores you and puts you back into ministry within the body. Can you say praise the Lord? That's our job. That's our job, guys, is to be tight-knit. That when somebody's broken, when somebody's hurting, we don't spread the gospel. No, we go and we spread love and we spread a help healthy relationship, a communication with one another where we lift and build that person and we tell that person that you're valuable to the body of Christ. We have those values as a church. I have, this is one of those interesting Sunday mornings. This is Thanksgiving Fellowship Sunday morning. It's usually a morning designed in our church every year as a celebration, as a time of worship and a time of praise. But I woke up this morning with a little bit different aura about me today. I woke up this morning with a little bit different understanding about me today and I, I was talking to Mark before we stepped out into the service today and I said Mark usually I have four pages of notes that's usually what I have I usually have four pages of notes and I usually preach about a 45 minute message and, and I said and today people are expecting me to possibly preach a 30 minute message because Sister Gail is warming the food in the back and we've got to get out and we've got to go and have the food today but do you know what kind of message God gave me today he gave me a seven page message today 
He gave me a seven page message today and I said God you've got to anoint me incredibly today because God I don't know how in the world I'm going to get through seven pages in 30 minutes. There's no way brother I can't even use the bathroom in 30 minutes. How in the world can I preach? Amen. How in the world can you do that? How can you even, even get into that? And so I began to pray and so here's what I'm going to do. Page two is gone. Amen. Amen. And page three is gone too. Now take your Bibles and flip with me in your Bibles over to the book of Matthew chapter number five this morning because in order to promote healthy relationships you have to do something you have to be around people in order to promote healthy relationships but anytime you get around people church family guess what happens next conflict that's what happens conflict happens look at your neighbor this morning and say you are different <laughs> come on look at somebody look at your neighbor this morning and say you are different you're incredibly different now, don't say it. sometimes that annoys me, but it does. It annoys us because any time you get around people, it annoys you. But in order to have a healthy relationship, you've got to be around them. You have to be around them. And guess what? Because they're so different, they're not going to see everything the same way you see it. And so Jesus was talking about conflict resolution one day and when Jesus was in the middle of his dissertation on conflict resolution Jesus said one of the boldest statements I've ever heard about conflict resolution I've ever heard or ever seen in the Bible Jesus said when there's a conflict going on within the body of Christ Jesus says here's what you should do you should cancel church until everybody repents and gets a clean slate and then bring the church back together Prove it to us, Pastor. Let's read it. Therefore, if you should offer your gift at the altar. What's that? That's having church. Jesus is talking to him. He's saying, look, when you're having church and you come to bring your gift at the altar. By the way, you can't have church unless you bring your gift. That's a whole other message. Hallelujah. You can't have church unless you bring your gift. Amen. If you come to church this morning and you didn't bring your gift, you're not in church, honey. You're not a part of the body of Christ unless you bring your gift. Because in order to go to church, Jesus said you've got to bring your gift. Hallelujah. So therefore, if you come to church and leave your gift, bring your gift to the altar, and you remember that your brother has something against thee. He's flipped the scroll, sister, as you were doing. If you have that against thee, he says this. He says, and therefore remember that your brother have all against thee. Leave there your gift at the altar and go your way and first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Jesus was saying, cancel everything, turn everything off, push church aside, and go and be reconciled with that brother then come back and have church why pastor because you can't have church when you got conflict going on within the body but let me tell you something when reconciliation comes to the body and people start loving one another and forgiving one another and they give their gift honey you have church like you've never had in all your life hallelujah that's how you have real church is you let all of the bygones be bygones and you let all of the unforgiveness go into the past and you wash it all under the blood and you accept one another and love one another. Now look at your neighbor and say, I appreciate you. I appreciate you. I mean, I can't have church unless I appreciate you and value you. Listen, Jesus said, cut the music off until you be reconciled. Jesus said, don't even take up the offering until you get it worked out between you and them. Jesus said, don't even cry crank up the sermon. Don't even open your Bible until you be reconciled with your brother or your neighbor. Why? Because Jesus wanted those disciples to know that you couldn't have church. You couldn't have real good Holy Ghost church unless that body was unified and reconciled and loving and caring and appreciating one another. In other words, Jesus was saying that in having a right relationship with one another is more important than having church. That's what he was saying. He was saying having the right relationship with people is more important than having church this morning. He wants us to be tight-knit. He wants us to be close with one another. He wants us to value one another. Let me give you some important words about getting along with people. The six most important words of getting along with people are these words. Six most important words with getting along with people. I admit I made a mistake. I admit, I made a mistake. Five most important words with getting along with people. You did a good job. You did a good job. Turn to your neighbor and say, you did a good job. Hey Amen. That food smells good back there. Praise the Lord. You did a good job. Four most important words with working with people is what do you think? 
What do you think? Four most important words with working with people, having a promoted relationship with people is what do you think? Three most important words with people is after you please. After you please. Not I love you, but after you please. Two most important words with working in a relationship. Thank you. <laughs> oh, see, some women should have threw their hanky right there. Amen. <laughs> Did his socks, did his laundry, made sure his shirt was ironed, amen. Two most important words in working with people is thank you, amen. Thank you, I appreciate you, I value you. One most important word in working in great relationships is we. It's we. We do everything together. We do it together. We enjoy it together. We produce it together. We do it as, as, as a group together. The least most important word in relationships is I. It's the word I this morning. Now let me just take the next 10 minutes and talk to our church family. If you're a visitor today, visiting with us today, I want you to tune out for the next 10 minutes. Amen. Get on your iPod, get on your phone. I want you to get on Facebook. And I want you to tune out just for a few minutes of time. Because for the next 10 minutes of time, visitors, everything that I'm about to say has nothing to do with you. Church family, I'm going to preach to you for the next 10 minutes. I won't talk to the home folks just for a few moments. Someone say, talk to me, Pastor. Amen. Amen. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you. And listen, today, I know this is not one of those days where you need to really get into people's business today. But listen, the Holy Ghost won't let me stop. So I'm going to get into your business just for a few moments of time. And for the next 10 minutes, I just want to preach to the home crowd. Here's what I want to say to the home crowd this morning. We are growing as a church. We're growing as a church. And we cannot continue to grow as a church until we as a church accept the responsibility to create new relationships within our body. We can't go any further as a church than the relationships you as a church are willing to accept and build with new people. Now we can stay at this level, guys. We can stay right here. We can stay at this level. And listen, we can have good church at this level. We can have great church at this level. We know at this level who's going to speak in tongues and who's going to give the interpretation. We know at this level who's going to prophesy, who's going to not prophesy. We know at this level of growth right now who's going to participate on that song and who's not going to participate on that song. We know at this level right now who's going to shout when we sing the old song and we know who's going to shout when we sing the new song because we all know each other at this level. But if we're going to get past this level, we've got to get to know new people. Yeah, we got to get to know new people. And we've got to start talking to them. And listen, when we start talking to them, we've got to show them that we actually desire to be their friend. Which, it, here's what it does. It promotes in us that we have to get past our comfort zone within our own lives and within our own church. Which means that although the church may be growing, there may still be people that are in this body that are still culminating and coming around and congregating around therefore and no more even within a growing body. And what those people have to do is they have to be moved of the conviction of the Holy Spirit to say, you know what, souls are dying and going to hell in West Plains and there are new people coming to our church and the least I could do within my own church is get out of my own comfort zone within my own church and meet and greet new people. I could do it. Why? Because we're probably not going to go out there and do it. Now that's just the, that's just the reality. Come on, somebody, talk to me. That's just the reality. We're probably not going to go out there and do it. Why? I'll I tell you what, let's prove it. I'll tell you, next week on Thursday afternoon at about 6.30, let's go out and do visitation. I wonder how many people would show up to help pastor do visitation. I wonder why. I wonder how many, how many people would come up with excuses and say, Pastor, I can't come today. I, I can't do this today. I can't go visit so-and-so today. I've got laundry to do. I've got work. I've got homes. I've got families. I've got people I've, I've got to go and fellowship with, and I can't come and do visitation pastor because I've just got all of this stuff on my plate well listen what are we going to do let them go to hell are we going to let them die and burn in eternal the least we could do guys is, is love them and care for them and become their friend when they come in here that's the least we could do but it's got to start here judgment's got to start here it's got to start at the house of God and so what I'm saying to the home folks today is I'm saying home folks it's time you get out of your comfort zone it's time you get out of your comfort zone, get out of your clique, get out of your group, even get out of your family unit. Pull yourself back out of your family unit and say, hey, look, there's a bigger family out here that I need to go and get with and understand, and that is the family and it's the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me talk to the home folks again this morning and say just a few more moments few more things to the home folks. Right now, because our church is growing, our church has one funnel for growth. 
It's this aisle right here. This aisle right here is the funnel for our growth. Most of our visitors never come down this aisle. We never, I have never seen in the history of our church, in the three years that I've been here, a visitor come down this aisle. Occasionally they'll come down this aisle. This is the favorite aisle in our church. How do you know it's the favorite aisle in our church? Look at all these people right here. All of y'all over there, you're good this morning. Look at this crowd over here, amen. It, I mean, they, they love it. Visitors love this aisle. Every person I've seen saved so far has come down this aisle. I've seen a few get baptized in the Holy Ghost coming down this aisle. But most of the salvations happen on this aisle, right? You say, Pastor, is this the holy aisle of Victory Family Worship Center? No, it's not, but you people like that carpet right there. You love it. You love that piece of real estate. I don't know what it is about that piece of real estate, but you people, you, you like it. You love it. What's going to have to happen? I need 12 people. I need 12 people. I need three couples out of this section, and I need three couples out of this section to get up out of this section. Not now. Not now. I just want you under conviction right now. But I need... And this is not really, this is really not about the conviction of the Holy Ghost. This is just about making room for our visitors, guys. It's about, my, why do they sit over here, Pastor? Because let me tell you something about visitors. Visitors are just like sheep. They're flighty. They're flighty. If you get within their bubble too much, they want nearest the door. Why? So that they can bust through the door. Husband can grab the kids, snatch them by the hair out of the nursery. The wife can run to the car, start the engine. They can throw them through the windows, get in the car, and drive away because that crazy church was being too nice to them. Some of you have visited those churches. Amen. Some of you have had those one of those aggressive pack dog greeters get up in your buzzle and in your bubble, and they've got so much paper they're shoving it in your face and saying, "Here, fill this out. Do this. Sign this. Do this. Join our church. Pay your tithes. Be faithful. Make this pew your permanent pew." Amen. And we've had those. And I've trained our greeters here at this church to be attack dog greeters. I've trained them to be like that. I want them to be like that. I'm like, Lolita, get in their face. Amen. Don't take no for an answer. Sharon, amen, you pound their feet to the floor. Grab them. Freddie, put them in an arm bar and set them down in the seat. I want every visitor that comes to our church to stay here. I want that. But what we've got to do, guys, now is we've got to graduate now and we've got to start looking at the obvious. And the obvious is half of our congregation doesn't set over here. They all set over here. And because because we've got this clogged up over here. Our visitors can't come in the door and feel comfortable. And so we got to move some things around, guys. we got to move some things around. So I'm challenging, I'm challenging three couples in this section, and I'm challenging three couples in this section to move out of these two sections and to move over here to this section. You say, well, Pastor, I need to get to my car. <laughs> This is my pew, Pastor. I love my pew. I, I mean, Pastor, don't you understand? The air works better on this side of the sanctuary. Pastor, don't you know that for, for almost two years that you've been the pastor here, this speaker up here has been out and it hadn't been working? That's why we sat over here so we can hear you over here. Guess what? We fixed the sound system. You can hear me over there now. Amen. The air works just as good on this side of the sanctuary now, so I'm just challenging. I'm just saying I need three couples in this section, and I need three couples in this section to get out of those sections, and I need you to move over here so that I can balance out the crowd. I'm not doing it for TV. I'm not doing it for show. I'm doing it so I can make room for visitors to come in and feel comfortable because they like that piece of real estate right there. So give up your pew. Give up your pew. Here's what else I need. I need ten cars. Not 10 families. I just need 10 cars not to park on the asphalt. I need 10 cars. Pastor, will that help healthy relationships in our church? You bet it will. It will make our visitors feel welcome. We'll love them and we'll care for them. Look at your neighbor right now and say, it's not about you. It's not about you. huh? It really isn't. It's not about you. Most people in church, when we get to this level, do you know at this level, this is where churches split? They split. They, most church splits occur, occur between 100 and 150 people. Most church splits don't happen in churches of 800 and 1,000. Why? Because whenever you get 100 to 150 people in the room, you still have chiefs and personalities, amen, that are there and a part of that family, and you have old clans that are there, and you've got warlord clan members, amen, and warlord chieftains within each clan that are over each section of the pews, amen, and they come each Sunday with their tomahawk and their feathers. 
each Sunday, and they're here, and the chieftains are among us here, and they're even here today. They're among us in this crowd. But what we got to understand, guys, is we've got to beat our, our, our swords into plowshares, and we've got to plow up new ground for new relationships together as a church family and see this thing grow and go beyond where it needs to go. If the tsunami... How many of you know we've been talking about the tsunami? If the tsunami of revival came to our church, guess what? It'd get clogged right there. It would. The first Sunday that we had 10 extra visitors, we'd stop right there. It would stop. It would stop. They wouldn't go over here. Why? Because they don't know what's out here. They've never been on this side of the church before. That's why we made this other lobby, guys. It's for the home folks. That other lobby is for the home folks. That lobby is for the visitors. Use it. Use it, guys. Help me. Help me grow this church. Help me do the simple things that will make this church the best church that it can be. Help me. Please help me. I can't go move your car. I can't move you out of your pew. All I can do is ask you and beg you and just ask you to help me. But why, Pastor? Because I'll never get this aisle big enough to grow it big enough to where all of you can stay here and be happy. I'll never do it. I'll never be able to do it. I've, tried, I've, I've thought of different ideas. I've thought, God, can we knock out that wall? Can we just make this section go back amen, into the parking lot what can we do because that's where they come from I need I need I need three couples over here and three couples over here to move over here I need 10 cars not to park on the asphalt I need you to park in the gravel well pastor if you're asking us to do that will you do it I'll tell you what I'll park in the gravel every Sunday you do I'll park in the gravel every Sunday you do. Well, Pastor, you need to be next door where you can get out in case someone gets mad at you. No, listen, I'll, I'll walk across the parking lot. Get, let's get out in the gravel. Let's park our cars out there. Let's promote healthy relationships, and let's grow this church. Let me say something else. Good. We need to help the elderly during meals and fellowships in our church. We need to help them. We need to help the elderly during meals and fellowships in our church. We're going to practice that today. When the elderly go back, we need to serve the elderly first. We don't need to let the kids go through the line first. We need to let the elderly go through the line first. Thank. Go ahead. Honor your elders. Amen. We need to do it. And when they go through the line first, we need ladies and we need men there, amen, to go get their cup for them. Why? Because when you put a cup on a walker and you push it, it's going to fall over. Okay, and so let's help one another. Let's promote one another. Let's prefer our neighbor and love our neighbor above ourselves, and let's honor the elderly. What, what else will that do? Let me tell you something. It'll bring value to our visitors when they see us loving and caring for the elderly in our church. It'll let them know that, hey, look, everybody counts. Everybody counts. Everybody counts. We need someone. We need a greeter and an usher at the door. And listen, guys, when you're greeting at the door, let me tell you something. Here's the front door right here. When you're greeting at the door, don't stand on the inside of the door. Don't stand on the inside of the door, greeters, when you're in the, when you're in the greeter position. If you are within five feet of the front door, you're too close. Get back here where you can welcome someone into the room. Now, if you want to work the door, stand on the outside of the door. That's why all bellhops at hotels work on the outside. Why? Because they open the door and they let them go in. But if you're standing here at the door and you do this, You may be trying to push the door open, but to a visitor, that may look like a frontal assault. <laughs> My Lord, they're going to hike the ball, and this guy's fixing to tackle me. What, you know, what's going on? Have mercy. Listen, open the door, stand on the outside of the door, and let the visitor come in the door. Why? Because we prefer our neighbor above ourselves. Well, Pastor, don't you love the home folks? Why are you talking about visitors this, this morning? Because we're here to reach the lost. And I can't reach lost people if I'm preaching to you every Sunday i got to have more people here. i got to have them here so I can preach to them. Well, pastor, we're supposed to go into all the world and get, well, then go get them. Go get them and bring them here. And when you get them here, don't badger them when you get them in the door. Make them feel welcome when they come in the door. Amen. Well, pastor, are you trying to tick everybody off this morning? No, I'm just trying to preach under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Now let me pick on the elders and the trustees, guys. Elders, trustees. It's time to mingle. It's time to mingle. Guys, you break my heart in a board meeting when you say, hey, who is that person whose hair looks like an explosion in a mattress factory and, and she wore that red dress the other day and who's that guy that did this? And who did, Do you know some of those people you're talking about have been coming to church here for six months and you don't know their name? Guys, 
guys, you got to mingle. You got to mingle, guys. You got to get out. You got to rub some shoulders, guys. It's not the pastor's responsibility to know everybody's name in the church. It's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to feed, feed the flock of God. It's your responsibility as an elder and a trustee to help me get to know these people. You should be introducing those people to me, not me introducing those people to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Guys, we got to mingle. Trustees, we got to mingle. Elders, we got to mingle. We can't keep congregating together around the pastor. We got to spread out. We've got to get out of our family units and say, hey, look, honey, I'm an elder in this church. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a trustee in this church. And pastor is challenging me to get out of my comfort zone. So I'm not eating with you today. I'm going over there to that single man that's sitting there in that. Come on, somebody. We're fixing to do it. We're fixing to do it. The altar calls what's fixing to happen back there in just a few moments of time. And we got to say, hey, look, I'm an elder. I'm a trustee, honey. I'm not eating with you today I eat with you every day anyway I see you at the house amen every day I'm going to leave you I'm going to get out of my comfort zone and I'm going to go sit over there with that single man I'm going to sit over there with that single group of men that have come to our church and I'm going to get to know them and I'm going to adopt them and love them in the faith amen 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 guys we got to mingle we got to start asking this question in our church here's, here's the huge question in our church we need to start asking is how long have you been attending how long have you been attending? Don't ever walk up to someone and say, is this your first time here? I promise you, every time you walk up to somebody in our church and say, is this your first time here? They'll say, well, I've been going here for the last six months. That'll be their answer. And a spirit of offense will get on them because you didn't know them for six months and now you're asking them, is this the first time you've ever been here? Don't ever ask that question in church. It's an abomination in the sight of God. Don't ask that question. Don't ever say, is this your first time here? People leave our church every time we have people come up to them and say, is this your first time here? Don't do that. They've been coming here a long time. Say, how long have you been attending? If you want a great relationship, let me tell you something that's awesome about great relationships, guys. Ask questions. Ask questions. Be a question asker. Ask questions. You wouldn't believe how people respond when you let them talk and you don't talk. And you just ask questions and you let them speak to you and open up their hearts to you. You wouldn't believe their prayer requests. You wouldn't believe the time they would spend with you. They wouldn't be, you wouldn't believe the time that they would value and honor your opinion when you allow them to speak first and you ask them questions. Sometimes I go I'm, on Wednesday nights, I'll, 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 uh, I'll leave here early and I'll say I'm going over to the college house. And Sister Karen knows why I'm going over to the college house because they have food over there. And I go, I go over to the college, the Christian campus house, where, uh, where Nate Holcomb is the uh, lead pastor over there to the Christian campus house. And I go in the college house, and there's usually 20 or 30 or 40 kids there from all different faiths that are there in the Christian campus house. What do you do when you get there? I just walk in and sit down in the middle of the living room floor when I get there. And when I sit there, most of the kids know who I am now. They know I'm Brother B. And I just start asking questions. What do you want to be? When you graduate, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? Who do you want to marry? Why are you wearing that dress? Why are you wearing this? What is that? Did you do your hair that way or did someone else do that for you? You know, I just ask them questions. I just get all in their business. Why? Because I found if you don't, if you don't ever let yourself get out of your comfort zone and connect and ask questions, people will never value you. They won't value you. They'll just shut you out and you'll never get to know them and they'll never be a part of your life and church family. Jesus is coming and people in West Plains are going to the hell because we're we're staying in our comfort zone and we don't want to get out of our comfort zone and go reach the lost. I swear it's that, guys. The next level for us, guys, is the lost. It's the lost. We're doing great with our facilities. We're doing good with our music. We're doing good with all the things that we do. We're doing good with it. Good things are happening. People are getting blessed. We're doing good in the altar time. But now, now, guys, we've got to get out of our comfort zone and we've got to say, hey, who am I working on this week? Who am I following up on this week? Who do I need to contact this week? Well, pastor, that takes work. Yeah, that's the work you're called to do. I thought my work was clocking into my job. No, that's just the provision for you to do your real job so that you can win a lost soul and you can promote a relationship. And listen, when you promote relationships, everybody needs history giving. You need to know their history. The only way you'll ever know their history is to ask questions. You need to promote affirmation among them. You see, there's two things about every person's personal history. Everybody's got one and each story is unique. It's unique. 
You wouldn't believe the people that when you ask questions, if you just simply ask questions, the people you're related to, the people you don't know, the people who used to live beside your family's family farm, and you never even knew that until you asked the question, or the people that grew up with you, or the people that graduated high school with you. I love relationships. I love people. I want to see people saved. I love preachers. I love preachers. This past week I got a phone call. One of my childhood friends that I grew up with in church, we were both called in the ministry at the same time. He's five years older than I am. He's pastoring a church in Oklahoma. He messed up. Messed up. We used to sing together. We used to play the piano together. We used to pray in the altars together. We'd go to camp together. He was one of the five guys in our church that all got called into ministry at the same time. and He committed adultery with a lady in his church. and His wife left him. But what's worse is his church booted him out. And after they booted him out, they didn't give him a severance package. So now he's homeless. Because his mom and dad back in Arkansas said, we don't want this sinner coming back to Arkansas. And so now one of my lifelong friends, Esther, is living on the streets in Oklahoma somewhere, a homeless man, because he messed up. Let me say something else to you about relationship. I'm not negating the fact that him committing adultery was a sin. I'm not negating that fact. I believe adultery is sin. Amen. And I believe that when you do that, you need to repent of it and you need to confess of it. But here's what else I believe. I believe a life is more important than a lesson. I believe a life is more important than a lesson. What do you mean? I mean, I'm going to go and try to find his life. I'm going to try to hunt that brother down and get him off of the streets and pull him close and love him and care for them. It doesn't mean that he doesn't need to learn the lesson, but the life is more important at this moment. His soul is more important than the lesson learned. And that's what we have going on in the body of Christ is we have everybody saying, Pastor, teach them a lesson. They're sinners, Pastor. Teach them a lesson. Teach them a lesson, Pastor. Drive this word of God into their head like a nail and a hammer, Pastor. Put it inside of them. Tell them they're going to hell, Pastor. Let them know that sin will separate you from God and you'll burn and rot in an eternal hell for all eternity, Pastor. You let them know that because that's your job. But yes, it's my job. But it's also my job to compel them and love them and reach out to them and promote them and edify them and bring them in and if they realize they're going to hell then they'll repent but if I don't save the life I can't ever teach them the lesson and a life is more important Lisa than a lesson it's more important than teaching them the Sunday school teachers you'll never teach them all the lessons you'll never get all the lessons taught so you have to save the life let me tell you something, some of the people that are coming into our church in the last days, it doesn't mean they're dumb, it doesn't mean they're ignorant, it doesn't mean that they're, that, they're, that they're some backwoods hillbilly somewhere, it doesn't mean that they don't understand or they can't comprehend, but there will be people that will come into our church in the last days before Jesus comes that all the faith and all the love they have in their heart is just enough faith for them to be saved. And they won't be able to learn all the lessons. They won't be able to accept all the lessons that you and I have to learn in order for us to be holy in order for us to be saved, in order for us to be sanctified. And we'll do our best to teach them as many lessons as we can, but we will value the life over the lesson. We will do it here. We will be the church that will save lives. We will not be the church that spends more time teaching the lessons than the church that saves lives. This is the type of church we're going to be. We're going to go find the life and we're going to go save it. Well, Pastor, what if they get in and they still need to learn the lesson? You know what? I think the Holy Spirit's got enough power. So, Mark, we're making a road trip, baby. We're going to go find that homeless preacher. We're going to go hunt him down. And where are you going? I don't know. I got five bedrooms at my house. I'm going to find that homeless preacher. Plays the piano much better than I do. Sings much better than I do. Awesome man of God. Thrown out by his family. Ostracized by his parents. Because of a mistake. 
And now he can't go home and have Thanksgiving. He can't go, he can't even go in a local Assembly of God church in Oklahoma without the Assembly of God gossip network spreading so through so 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 viciously through that whole state of Oklahoma that every preacher in Oklahoma knows what he did and, and how he sinned and how he failed and how he messed up. I just wonder, God, is there one preacher in Oklahoma that would love that little homeless preacher that I grew up with, Father, and care for him and save his life over the lesson learned? There's going to be some people coming to our church, guys, that they need a lesson. I understand that. I'm not negating the fact that we don't need to teach people lessons. But there's going to be some lives and some souls that are going to come in and they just need to get saved first. They just need to find Jesus and get saved. And then once they get saved, let's love them. Let's love them. Let's put up with some of their antics. Let's put up with some of their mistakes and some of the things they do. Well, Pastor, aren't you going to... I'll do my best to correct them and affirm them and love them in the Lord. But the life is more important than the lesson learned. And we're going to learn their history and then we're going to affirm people. Why? Because Proverbs 16 and 24 says, Pleasant words are as a honeycomb. They're sweet to the soul and they're health to the bones. And we're going to start affirming people and we're going to build people up. I want you to go home tonight. We don't have church tonight, but I just want you to mark this in your notes. Go home and read Philippians chapter 1 verses 3 through 11. Read Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. You'll find Paul says the word you more than any other word he says in that chapter. Over and 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 over again, Paul starts talking about you. You, you, you're important to me. You're important to me. You're important to this. You're important to the grace of the gospel. You're important to the bowels of the mercy of Christ Jesus. You are important. Paul prefers them over himself. And he starts talking about the Philippians and he starts building them up in affirmation. Go home and read it. Philippians chapter 1 verses 3 through 11. You'll find there's some incredible affirmation skills Paul lets out in that chapter right there as he speaks highly of the Philippian believers and of the Philippians that are coming into the body. And let me tell you something about praise, guys. When you affirm somebody, second-hand praise is sometimes more significant than first-hand praise. Did you hear what I said? I said second-hand praise is, more, is sometimes more significant than first-hand praise. First-hand praise is saying it from your mouth face-to-face. But second-hand, pra- second-hand praise is sending them a thank-you card in the mail. That's second-hand praise. Practice second-hand praise. Let them know you're thinking about them. Let them know that you want them to get well. Let them know that you're praying for them. Let them know that they said an awesome thing in Sunday school class last Sunday and it blessed your spirit. And and write it back to them and say back to them exactly what they said in your Sunday school class. Let them know. Tell them that you appreciate them coming to the revival. Tell them that you appreciate them, that you got a chance to sit with them and become their friend in the church fellowship today. Promote a healthy relationship, guys. You see, an irresistible church that promotes healthy relationships is a church that builds covenant. What is covenant? We have the covenant of time. Let me say this to you about time. There's no time like the present, and there's no present like time. Best present you'll ever give a soul is the present of your time. And there's no time like the present, and there's no present like time. Let me say something else about promoting healthy relationships. When you start asking them questions and the relationship opens up and you get to know that person, sinner, saint, backslider, heathen, most valued person in the church, most undervalued person in the church, ask them what their dream is. And when they tell you their dream, don't laugh at their dream, but rejoice with their dream. There's been some people that I found out are not my friends. Who are the people that are not your friends? The people that laugh at your dream. Those are the people that are not your friends. The people that are your friends, they may not understand all of your dream. They might not get all the components and the nuts and the bolts of your dream. But when you share your dream with them, their eyes light up with anticipation and expectation with you in the dream that you share with them. And let me tell you something. You want to know when you've set the hook on a lost soul, when they tell you their dream and you celebrate it with them, that's the time to throw in the net and pull a lost soul to Calvary. Is when they share their dream in their heart and they say, hey, 
when I grow up one day and I get money and I, and I do this, I, you know, I've had some sinners tell me some of the most awesome dreams about the church that I've ever heard in my life. I had a little girl one time at youth camp tell me, she said, when I grow up, Brother B, I know the girl was on drugs. I know she was on methamphetamines. I know the little girl was just strung out and beat up and messed up. But I had that little girl, Kim, look at me in my eye, and she said, when I grow up and I get a little older, she said, I was abused by my dad when I was growing up. And she said, when I get, when I get older, she said, I want to have a big house, and I want to make an orphanage, and I, I, and I want to bring kids into that orphanage, and I want to love them, and I want to care for them in that big orphanage, and I want to have that big house to do that. Now listen, she wasn't saved enough sitting in that chair that day to ever fulfill that dream. But it wasn't until somebody took the time to listen to her dream and value her dream. And I said, you know what? That would be awesome, Amber. That would be so cool, Amber. Amber, if you do that dream, you'd win kids. Kids would come to Jesus and kids would get to know Jesus and kids would find Jesus and kids would be loved and cared for in your house. Amber, do you want that dream? Yeah, I want that dream. Then, Amber, you got to sell out to God and give all of yourself and all of your heart to God. Watch that little girl run to an altar in a camp service and plow her face down in an altar in a camp service crying out to God for God to forgive her of her sin. And God to wash her and to cleanse her from her sins so she could go out and rescue others. And Amber's getting close to fulfilling her dream. She's a youth pastor. She's getting close. What if you'd ignored her? I don't know. Maybe God would have sent somebody else. Or maybe not. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying the people that are in the pew right now beside you and the visitors that are in this room right now are appointed for your fellowship today. They're appointed. They're here so they can make a connection with you today. Well, Pastor, what if we don't connect today because we're busy? It's all right. There'll be new visitors here next Sunday. But what about the ones that were here today? What about the relationships that were needed to be made today? Stand to your feet all across this room. One of the hardest things for me to do as a pastor is to juggle the responsibility of loving and caring for sheep and meeting new sheep. Can I get some preachers to say amen? It's a tough job. Because I have a hundred sheep that already know me and love me and care for me and they want to spend time with me. And guess what? I want to do that too. I want to love them too. I want to care for them too. I want to go by their house too. And I want to fellowship with them too. And I want to get to know them too. But what I'm finding is, is as this sheep flock is now becoming a sheep ranch, there's times when I've got to step over the fence out of this herd right here and I've got to go check on this herd over here. That's just a new place for me, Kathy. It's a new place for me, Glenn. And I need under shepherds and I need sheep dogs and I need people to help me. And we need to clear out this pen right here <laughs> so we can get more sheep in this pen over here, all right? And I promise you, if you sit there next Sunday, I'll only have a piece of barbed wire in your seat. It's okay. I love you. Do you know I love you? I love you guys. It's on my heart. Let's make relationships. Let's get to know people. Let's move out of our comfort zone and let's value and care for people that we wouldn't otherwise do if, if someone didn't challenge us and get in our business to do it. Let's bow our heads in this place. And If you feel the way I do this, this, this way this morning, if you feel the same way this pastor is feeling today about the lost and about loving and caring for others, and promoting relationships, we're going to pray a prayer. And as we pray, I want all of you that are feeling the same way I'm feeling, I want you to pray with me. And I want you to pray a prayer of saying, God, help me to accept others. I want you to pray a prayer of, Lord, move me out of my comfort zone and move me into a place, Lord, to love and to value other people, Lord, and to promote healthy relationships within this body. And that, Lord, when there is a conflict,